Welcome to this segment of the Wealth Zone University. I'm your host, Don Moraney, and we're looking forward to having a great show today. Um, you uh, met my guest in a prior segment, and so we're going to talk about something that we think is really, really pertin pertinent to business owners. So what I'd like you to do are two things. One, put your cell phone down, get a pad and a pencil, move up to the TV, and then call all the business owners that you know. New business owners, seasoned business owners, everybody in between, because John and I are going to talk about something that every business needs to be aware of. So I'll introduce, reintroduce you to my guest, John Hale. John Hale was here in the prior segment. He is the CEO of Cornerstone Group, and I'm going to ask John to tell us a bit about Cornerstone Group and about himself so uh, he can reintroduce himself to our audience. Hi, hey. John. Hi, Don. How you doing? I'm doing fine. Well, thank you for having me back. We're, um, we're real excited to be here. So we at the Cornerstone Group are a business advisory firm. We help firms scale and to grow. We help them to, number one, um, identify profitable opportunities so they can create jobs and also maximize shareholder wealth. Mm -hmm. And a little bit about my background, of a banking and finance background. I'm a uh, commercial loan officer at um, two banks and also had the privilege and pleasure of serving President uh, Barack Obama wow. um, as an appointee okay. at the SBA, mm -hmm. Deputy Associate Administrator for the Access to Capital Program, and ran the OSDBU office, or the Small Business Office at the U.S. Department of Energy, and that's the Office of Small Disadvantaged Business Utilization. So I'm going to stop John right here, because the reason we're <laughs> smiling at the word OSDBU is because we both think it's a real funny acronym. Yes. So tell them what OSDBU means, please. Yes, sure. It's the <laughs> Office of Small and Disadvantaged business utilization and we're there to advocate for small businesses um, to help them navigate the federal government and to find out information regarding federal government contracting at the major agencies. And so each government agency has an OSDBU office? Yes it does. Every, each government agency ha has an OSDBU office. Um, the OSDBU uh, was established in 1978 and so we are there to um, serve the small businesses to help them identify opportunities and people to connect with, with within each federal agency. Okay, and so the OSDBU is the business owner's advocate inside the agency then? Yes, it is, and okay. also if the business owner engages with the OSDBU in a uh, proactive way, um, the OSDBU can really be part of the business development team for the business owner. Mm, okay. Yes. Okay. So back, you were the OSDBU at the Department of Energy then? Yes, I okay. was the OSDBU Department of Energy about four and a half to five years. Okay. And so finished, I interrupted you, so oh, sure. go ahead with your spiel, kiddo. <laughs> oh, yeah. Thank you, thank you. So part of that information is how do I, as the business owner, empower the OSBU to be your advocate. Mm -hmm. So if you can impress the OSBU with your knowledge, your thoroughness about their agency, what they do, and specifically the value you can add, what problems can you solve, what questions can you answer, and maybe even identify pro problems that they don't know about, then they'll be more armed um, and equipped with information to help to advocate for you um, inside the department. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So now Cornerstone Group, yes. you're actually taking the advocacy position that you had inside government for the Obama administration and moved it into your own company essentially. Correct, yes. Yeah, so a group of us got together um, after the administration. The focus of the Cornerstone Group is to help companies grow and to prosper. And within that we have what we call CPR, um, Capital, Partnerships, and Revenue. Okay. So take the experience of the commercial sector, the private sector, with the expertise in federal government contracting, and under that contract, those are three areas that we found that companies struggle with, mm -hmm. um, small and mid-sized companies. One mm -hmm. was capital, mm -hmm. how to identify the capital that they need for, their, for where they are in the growth cycle, life cycle of their business. Partnerships, so why do I need strategic partners? Um, as Michael Jordan once said, um, when he was part of the dream team to be successful, we often check our egos at the door. Mm. Sometimes the entrepreneurs just check their ego at the door, realize they need some assistance to, and actually develop uh, strategic partnerships that can benefit them, it can benefit others. Then, of course, we focus on revenue because that's what you need. That's the lifeblood of the business and the revenue. Um, and if you pursue the right opportunities, they'll be profitable so you have cash flow and you can create wealth that way. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so today we're going to be talking about value and we're going to yes. be talking about wealth. Mm -hmm. But before we actually get into that, mm -hmm. I want to talk about CPR again. Sure. Because the acronym Capital Partnerships and Resources, in my mind, are the basis of us building value and wealth into a company. And so on the capital side, right. um, do you find capital for them? Do you f help them develop relationships so they can get capital? Tell me more about each sure. one of those um, 
uh, initials in CPR, if you don't Definitely. Mind. So folks on the Capitol think it's a very good question. We use our experience as former bankers, um, um, commercial loan officers, to work with companies uh, and assess their operation and determine why we would or would not lend money to them. Mm -hmm. And then also based upon uh, that assessment, we go through and ask them how much money do they think that they need and what are they basing that on. So we help companies walk through and really understand their business, its operations from a lender's perspective. Now be that a commercial loan officer as a bank, there's non-bank lenders, mm -hmm. or there's um, what we call um, uh, social capital, mm -hmm. where you may go to friends, family, members of the community that may be entrepreneurs, business owners, whoever that just may have money to invest in your business, mm -hmm. but they're all gonna look at what is your ability to repay us. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so we typically start with, are your financial statements, are your books and operations in order that you can demonstrate that there's value, that if I invest money and you be a, a, a uh, loan to your company, that the loan will be used in a way that will grow the business and hence through that growth you can pay me back. Right. They want to be able to know that they can be paid back where, when, and how, and obviously that's the interest rate negotiation. Right, and a good so, CFO wants to know how we're going to use it yes. and pay it back. So yes, and pay it back. we're on the Definitely. same page. Right, yes. Okay. And then also with partnerships. Um, we focus on partnerships from the standpoint, what are the strategic partners we need to have to grow? And when I said check your ego at the door, part of that is a realization um, that we can't be all things to everybody. So when I look at our business vis-a-vis -vis our competition, where are we strong and where are we weak? Mm -hmm. And how can we enhance the areas we're weak by forming strategic partnerships? Okay. And then how do we go through and help define a strategic partner that is beneficial to us? So there's at least three different types of strategic partners. One would be the um, kitchen cabinet to your firm. So think of, start your business like you're going to be a, a Fortune 500 a company. Which you should. <laughs> yes. So who's going to be on your board of directors? Why should they be there? What value can they bring to you and what value can you offer them? Right. Um, second would be is, who are the professionals you're going to work with? You're surely going to have a lawyer, you're going to have a CPA, but what other professionals are you going to have? And as you grow your business, you may want to find a real good personal financial advisor as well. So again, when we talk about wealth maximization, you're looking at these strategies from the beginning. And then also you want to have other businesses and firms that you can work with, be they small or they large. Maybe they are in industries that will actually uh, complement the work you do. Mm -hmm. Or in some cases, they could be competitors, but maybe you can join together and go after bigger opportunities that you couldn't do that by yourself. Okay, joint venturing. Joint venturing, mm -hmm. yes. And so those are aspects of that partnership you should have. Okay. And so we spent some time and um, actually did some research and looked at why do people get divorced, couples get divorced. Now, we're, so, not, we're, now we're not talking about business couples, we're talking about personal couples. Personal couples, couples. okay. But those same issues or challenges of commitment um, that come in, communication, et cetera, are the same thing you're looking at joint venturing or strategic mm -hmm, partnering. Mm -hmm. Because you need to define for your business owner self, and don't be shy about it, what do you need to get out of this? Right. And B, write it down and know it. And if you can't get those out of it, then you shouldn't pursue that potential joint venture. And so essentially you're saying joint venturing is like being married, right? <laughs> Once you sign that contract, you do sign it, it's not a marriage license, but it is a contract. Um, and it, you know, you could be borrowing money, mm -hmm. pursuing contracts, mm -hmm. or you could be taking on actual liabilities, contingent liabilities. So yes, there's the upside, we're all focused on the revenue, but think about, um, you know, I'm signing a contract here. Yeah. So you want to make sure that you understand what you want and your needs are getting met out of it. And if you can't get that out of that partner, that's fine. Then find somebody find else. Find another partner. That's Absolutely. right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Definitely. And the revenue side. Yes, and on the revenue side, we really want to pursue, this may sound kind of comical, but opportunities that are profitable. But to know that you're profitable, you have to know what your costs are. Mm -hmm. What is your cost for delivering your service? So early in my career, I spent time uh, restructuring companies, mm -hmm. privately held companies. I'd be the interim CFO for troubled companies, meaning the politically correct term, they were losing money. And so oftentimes you learn from other people's mistakes in that business. But you really have to understand what is your cost for delivering that, that revenue service. And know at what point is your point for which this is not a good opportunity, I'm going to walk away. Um, I was on a panel um, when I was, I was the director of the Department of Energy, and a company, a small business, 
um, won a big con seven hundred million dollar contract, mm -hmm. and they beat out Raytheon and Lockheed Martin. Wow! But they walked through. They had a filter, uh, Don. Of about five steps, they went through to filter these opportunities to make sure that this was the best opportunity for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we should be evaluated. We should take that same due diligence, same due diligence, and approach as to why this is a good opportunity to me. So we need to look at the cost. We need to look at the resources it will take to deliver that product or service. Understand what our minimum uh, profitability threshold is. Um, understand how can we leverage this contract to, to additional and to more contracts. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And also under revenue is mm -hmm. diversifying revenue, having more than one source. Definitely. Another thing we, we find is having you know, diversification, which is the other way of saying that, is not be too concentrated in, in, in a handful of single customers. Mm -hmm. You want your revenue to come for all your, you know, you don't want to be concentrated for more than, you know, 10 to 15 percent in any one customer. Customers change their mind. Yep. Things change outside of your control as a business owner. Things always change. Relationships change. Who's who's um, deriving that? Be it in the mm -hmm. government or the commercial sector, a contact may change. The the, the whoever's you, who your customer strategic focus may change. They may defund that contract. Nothing that you've done wrong, but guess what? You're in a lurch. You're in a lurch. So you want to diversify that portfolio. You can look at um, within the same industry, industries that complement you. When I was in the Osbu director, I would tell businesses. You should have a three-legged stool approach. You should have, you know, government contracting, which would be federal, state, and local. Right. Commercial sector, and then you should export. Export. And my biggest challenge with them, if your business could not do those things well, then maybe, A, you need to look at your business model, but also maybe you're in a commodity-type business or in a situation mm -hmm. where what value are you really adding okay. if you can't pursue those different customers. Well, you know, that sets up a good basis for our discussion about mm -hmm companies building wealth, yeah. especially the part where each one of those capital, mm -hmm. partnerships, right. revenue, actually drive the ability for a company to be, go beyond profitability right. into shareholder wealth. Right. And so let's introduce that, sure. wealth maximization. Mm -hmm. um, we think that it's important for a company to realize that when they start early, mm -hmm that not only should they be working to build a profit, right. but they should also be thinking long range about building value and building wealth. Right, yes. And so, in your opinion, just quickly, mm -hmm. how soon should a company start thinking about the two things that, that they need to be doing, profitability mm -hmm. and wealth? Mm -hmm. And we're gonna get to that in the second segment. Yep. Mm -hmm. But right now, the important thing is that we both believe yes. that the earlier a company begins to think about the long-term outcome yes. or, or event for its company, mm -hmm. the sooner they're going to be able to plan for it. Right. And our discussion about wealth that we're going to get into mm -hmm. is going to talk about basically how that should materialize yes. over mm -hmm. a period of time. Definitely. But with your background and experience, mm -hmm. your company can help them to navigate that entire spectrum. Uh, definitely. And when you, when you start up your business, we'll get a little bit more here in the second segment, you're going to look at what is your business model, meaning how are you going to divide your revenue. Um, maybe you should have more than one source of that. Okay. And you should look at a forecast as well. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Uh, we're going to take a break. We'll be back in a couple of seconds. Don't touch that dial. Hi, everyone. The objective of the Wealth Zone University is to change your mind about money to change your financial future. Hi. I'm your host, Don Moraney. In the Wealth Zone University, my guests and I talk about a wide variety of business, financial, and other worldly topics. We are seeking to both educate and entertain you. We emphasize that the information and discussions are my opinion, perspectives, and ideas, and those of our guests. We in no way intend to deliver or provide financial, tax, or business advice. You should consult with your tax, accounting, financial, insurance, and legal advisors regarding the impact, application, or pertinence of any topic or opinion that we share on the Wealth Zone University. Thank you for being a part of our audience, and please continue to communicate with us through email and Twitter because this is your show. Welcome back to the Wealth Zone University. We're going to jump right into our topic with John. Yes. We're talking about wealth maximization. Yes. Now, that's 
the, the term is stockholder wealth maximization. Right, yeah. But you know, that's, that's a concept we don't even want to get into here. Right. We're going to bring it down a little bit smaller, smaller to yes. uh, the small business community, and we're just going to call it wealth right. maximization Definitely. right now. But your definition of what wealth maximization is, mm -hmm. um, give me your definition, the cornerstone's definition of wealth maximization. Yeah, thank you, Don. This is a very good question. The wealth maximization is really want to optimize the value of your company. And you want to look at doing this over a long-term basis. You want to be profitable. And to break that down even further, you want to have positive cash flow. And it should be actually be sustainable. It can be repeated year over year, year after year. So it's long-term, it's sustainable, and it's positive cash flow. And then what you do with that cash flow as we'll get into to the segment that will create the value which will lead to wealth maximization. Mm -hmm. And so understand, we're talking about wealth at two levels. We're talking about your company having value yes. and your company having wealth. Yes. And we're talking about the owner yes. having their value and wealth, two separate things. Mm -hmm. Our discussion today is going to be about the company. Correct. Mm -hmm. And because we do believe that building value in that entity that you built Right. sweat for, That's live right. every single day, mm -hmm. and hopefully we'll be able to uh, transition out of or, or have a legacy is the first thing that we need to be doing. Definitely. You know? Mm -hmm. So w when a business starts, mm -hmm. we're all taught that we're supposed to drive for the profit. Yes. You know, that's our objective, mm -hmm. to make sure we make a profit. Definitely. Seldom are we told that there's something beyond profitability. Right. In our, my mind as a CFO, mm -hmm. that becomes positive cash flow. Right. But even beyond positive cash flow is our value and our wealth. Well, yes. So let's you and I talk about, before we can even get to building value and wealth, right. um, basically uh, John CPR right. is what we need to be implementing okay. um, as we drive for our profitability, yes. which is our first um, foundation. foundation. Right. And so you mentioned some things that you feel are really important for new business owners to know mm -hmm. about driving towards that, that goal of profitability on paper, mm -hmm. positive cash flow in the bank. Right, definitely. Um, share, share some of that with me. Yeah, I think it's really important for them when, as they focus on the CPR, the capital, the partnerships, and the revenue, that they really also focus on that profitability but that cash flow and keeping track of their cash flow. That may sound simple, but it can become very complicated. So it's knowing the cost of um, delivering the service that you're going to have. And then also from a cash flow standpoint, um, understanding when you earn those profits, mm -hmm. um, what are you going to do with that cash? Uh, and also hidden in there is that means that there's some business that's not good business for you. It's just as important to say no to a potential opportunity mm -hmm. that's not going to give you the, the um, uh, margins not going to give you the profit or the cash flow because you will be dedicating your resources. And so mm -hmm. there's the opportunity cost of servicing or um, a client, potential new client, um, where, you, where, where you're not going to be profitable or generate that positive cash flow. Mm -hmm. You can't buy uh, market share. I mean, I want to get out there, get my name, my company name out there. And you should always vet that work and evaluate it and make sure that you can actually earn a profit delivering that product okay. or service. We like to say that making a profit is an objective, right. but having positive cash flow is a necessity because without liquidity, you can't do any of the things that we're talking mm -hmm. about. Um, and so positive cash flow definitely has to be something that we build into our company and have as a goal when amen. we initially start. Yes, um, amen, amen, and amen <laughs> to that. And one way to realize that is as you're starting your company, growing your business, what is your forecast? do a cash flow forecast mm -hmm. it's very realistic and detailed so you will know week by week month by month looking forward the next um, 6 12 18 24 months what does my business look like and based upon that you'll know where your break even is the fixed costs you have to cover and all the decisions you have to make um, as it relates to managing your business and like how much rent at least I can pay the staff I can bring on, a conference, a trip maybe I should go to, et cetera, mm -hmm. all that will filter through that. And you'll be able to understand and look at your projections. Am I developing and building positive cash flow? Because you want to know, when is this positive cash flow going to happen, and mm -hmm. is it sustainable? Yeah, and what I have to, my obligations when it comes in. Yes. So one of the things that we tell clients is mm -hmm. that not to spend all of the money that goes into your business bank account. Right. That we should be carving some amount out, 10%, 12%, whatever, mm -hmm. and leaving it. Yes. We need to learn not to spend 
all the money that comes into an account, which is basically what you're saying. Right. We need to know how much it costs to be in business, Yes. make sure that we've got the revenue to cover that, mm -hmm. know when that revenue is coming in, yes. and that ca cash flow forecasting is what does it. Right, and, and why it's so important to realize that, that it's not how much money you're going to make, the timing of the cash is so critical. Because our, be it employees, be they contractors to 99 or um, uh, W-2 employees, mm -hmm. be it the rent and other fixed obligations we have, maybe we're licensing software, renting computers or other equipment, they're going to come due every week and every mm -hmm. month. Mm -hmm. But customers may slow pay us. They may dispute our product or service and say, I'm only going to pay you 80% or 50 percent and may try to take advantage of us as a small business. Hey, I can outlast you. You may say I can take some <laughs> revenue better than others. These things unfortunately happen. Mm -hmm. I'm supposed to pay you in 30 days. Maybe they'll pay you 60, 90. Maybe they pay you <laughs> by and by. Um, but those are things we have to know. And to your point of saving that money and having that cushion um, becomes critical um, to be able to know that. And we're going to digress a minute because mm -hmm. we didn't talk about this, but that brings us to the point that we have to determine how to retain the customers yes. that are good mm -hmm. and not be afraid to get rid of the customers that aren't. Because we both believe that yes. keeping a customer is much more efficient, efficient and effective than looking for new customers, right? Oh, definitely. I mean, um, obtaining new customers, going through the sales cycle, winning their trust, getting in the door, get them to listen to you versus someone else, and then at some point, get them to make a decision, <laughs> but you're not done yet, because mm -hmm. you've got to get them to make a decision and pay you a certain mm -hmm. amount when you want to get paid. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. yeah, there's a whole lead time and a process of that is so tough. And that's why when we provide that great customer service, we want them, but Don, to your point, it's just like some customers or contracts or bids or opportunities aren't good ones for you. Don't be afraid to let a customer go. Exactly. I mean, if they're to the point where they're um, the opportunity cost of your time is so critical. If you're servicing them and there's not the value there, you're not making any money, maybe it's a very low margin, um, those are critical decisions. And if you have your forecast of can I afford to let them go or not, again, if you've got that template or that forecast of foundation in your business, you may find that, hey, um, I may have to let them go mm -hmm. or offer them less service so you can spend time for people that appreciate your time, but they may be hindering you from growing your business as well. And another concept we want to get across mm -hmm. is that business is not necessarily about commerce, it's more about economics. Yes. And we're taught that business is about commerce, right. the, the, the movement and sales and everything else. Right. But really it's about the production of wealth, the consumption of wealth, mm -hmm. and once we start thinking about it in a broader framework, yes. we can kind of envision the reason that we're talking about value and wealth, because it's attainable. Right, and it's, and it's go by why did you start your company and your business? Did you start it to work 50, 60, 70, 80 hours a week and like you have a job? Or did you start your business to the point where you can see where it's going to grow to have an economic event where mm -hmm. you're creating value there? Mm -hmm. And that will add that mindset will take on the type of business you start, why you started your business plan, but then um, the way that you look to grow your company. And so we always like to say that if you, uh, if a uh, new business owner begins to think of their business as an asset, mm -hmm. an economic asset. Yes. When we go in as CFOs, we basically tell the business owners that you're an asset manager. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got this baby right. that you built, mm -hmm. that you started, that you sweat, that you love, that you live right. 24 yes. hours a day. Right. Um, that baby needs to grow and yes. be healthy. Mm -hmm. And how that happens is by good planning, yes. good cash flow, mm -hmm. and now that we've got uh, our acronym CPR, yes. we can kind of take all that and put it into uh, one spot and make sure that they understand exactly what's going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. go ahead. No, please. <clears throat> so when they start putting that together, that will look at the issue of how we're uh, creating value mm -hmm. for our company, for the employees, and that value creation will lead to wealth because it gives us opportunities for a liquidity event, which could mean um, someone wants to buy your company because they mm -hmm. see the value, mm -hmm. customers will talk, um, there's more value there, or maybe you want to sell part or all of your company. But there's, 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 there's the value curation is um, you will be able to um, get the cash out of the company in mm -hmm. those couple ways. And so looking at wealth, wealth is a long-term objective. Yes. So it's not five years, not ten years, right. it's, it could be 15, 20 years. Mm -hmm. But planning for that has to start as early as possible in order to achieve it. Definitely. And so basically when the company becomes <coughs> wealthy, mm -hmm. because 
you own it right. or I own it, right. then that wealth actually is it ours. To us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it behooves us then to begin to put the things in order to have that become the objective or the goal at some point in time in the future. You know, you a very good point of thinking about your company. A couple points to bring up. One is uh, delayed gratification, personally. Is if you have your company and you want to grow it, um, you've, the cash comes out of it, the value comes out, what are you going to do with it? Mm -hmm. There's an old saying that if you take care of the business, the business will take care of you. So that entails some degree of delayed gratification mm -hmm. as you're building your company, be it a product or service. What differentiates you from your competition? Why are people buying your product or service? And it has to be more than just Don's my best friend, I grew up with Don. That's why Don is at the Marriott Corporation, IBM or GM or, or um, you know, um, down to um, DOD, mm -hmm. um, it has to be more than just that relationship. Mm -hmm. There has to be a mm -hmm. value there. And if you reinvest in what creates the value, if it's a technology company, you're in the next generation of technology or service. If you're in a service business, maybe looking at a technology platform. How can you invest in the software to help you deliver what you're doing? So that way you create a different line of business, right? You can license the software and create mm -hmm. royalties in a stream of passive income that will complement your professional service. And if you're in a professional service business, you need to have talent. What differentiates you from the next company are the talented people. That's right. So are you willing to delay some of your gratification to pay to have talented people and give them a professional environment where um, not only are they making the you know, salary or bonuses, whatever your compensation structure is, but there's a recognition that they're getting something more out of their job, that the people want to know that they're making a difference. Mm -hmm. And if you can do that with your staff, your employees, not only do you, you reduce turnover, which is expensive for you, and that's a warning sign as a customer. I've, I've bought services, and when folks came in with multiple project leads or managers, I'm seeing a new face every couple months. I'm like, this is not, it's, it's there's not, a red flag here. There's a time I told my staff something's not right here. Exactly. Um, but those are things to do. If you take care of your business that way, that value ultimately will accrue to you as the owner. And as a service business, having employees or contractors mm -hmm. helps you to leverage your time, mm -hmm, yep. your expertise, right. and you absolutely have to use leverage in order to maximize <clears throat> the one person that you've got. John, I really do appreciate the time to sit down and Definitely. do our little part two here. Yes, <laughs> you know? yes, it's been great. And uh, folks realize that um, when John and I are together, He's smarter than I am. <laughs> um, so um, I know you think I'm brilliant, but John yeah, is smarter are. than I am. Yes. But you know, thank you for hanging out with us for again. Definitely. And thank you for helping us share the fact that uh, we believe that each business owner should be looking to become wealthy and have their company become wealthy early in their lives. Definitely. Thank you, buddy. Thank you, Dan. All right. All right.